All right, I think maybe all the technology is finally sorted out here, so uh, we can get started. And um, yeah, I guess most of you look familiar. Is there anybody who's not coming from the GeoPython course? Okay, that's good then. Most everything should be kind of familiar for how things are going to operate. So yeah, welcome. Um, this is the quantitative geology course that used to uh, previously, it was basically part of, uh, or GeoPython was part of this course, and now this is its own separate thing. But in effect, it's not really any different than it was last year in terms of like what you're going to learn and what you're going to do. Um, the good news is that you get basically twice as many credit points as you used to because Everybody hated it last year with how much work we put them through for five credit point course. So um, I guess that's that's maybe good news. Uh, in terms of how things are going to work, we've got a different course web page. You can go there, and um, pretty much everything that we'll do in the course will be on the web page. So same as we did in GeoPython. Uh, you might have seen I set up the. The recording stuff, so we'll record the lectures and put those online, um, and all the lesson materials and everything else will be on the course web page. The uh, web address, I think you can already find it on the GeoPython course, but it's just introqg.github.io. Um, so quite similar to the GeoPython course, it's just introqg instead of geo-python. And um, I guess there are maybe a few course details that we could go over that might be helpful. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly run through this stuff. You've already found the room, so we don't necessarily need to worry about where we are on Mondays. But on Thursdays, and actually mostly on Wednesdays, on one Thursday, um, we're going to have the, the work sessions like we did for the GeoPython course. They're going to be in different classrooms, so they won't be in the GIS classroom like they were before um, because the GIS classroom is not available for us. So uh, this week on Thursday we will be in this room from 8 to 10. Normally we'll be meeting on Wednesdays from 9 to 12. Uh, I think there was some kind of conflict with an exam or something else that was that made us have to be scheduled on Thursday this week. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what the situation was but um, yeah, Mota and usually I will also um, be here to help you working on the exercises on those sessions. Last year, there were a lot of people who had a problem with the time for the work session. If it's on Wednesdays from 9 to 12, does that work for you or does that... Okay. So, okay, so there's at least a few problems. I mean, uh, is it totally overlapping or is it like, it's 10 to 12, okay. Okay, so um, we can see the trouble can become the fact that it's hard to find classrooms for other times, so it might be difficult to get a, a different room. But um, maybe what I can do is send out a Moodle, or Moodle, I always mix the two, Doodle poll. Um, with possible alternative times for the work session just to see if there's one that works better for everybody. Um, if this is the time that works best for most people, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to stick with this one. Um, but that means that maybe Lotha and myself can make a point to try to be here at 9 o'clock sharp on those mornings so that like, for those of you who need to go to the 3D modeling after, um, you can get some, some help. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I can try to make the doodle poll uh, even during class today and send that out. Otherwise, um, it, this is like the GeoPython course in the sense that there's no textbook that's required or anything. There's some links here on the course page if you're interested. Um, this Python programming introduction to computer science is more relevant for the GeoPython course than for this one. But there's some other things below here, um, like this geodynamics of the lithosphere text and this quantitative thermal chronology <laughs> textbook. Um, that if you're curious about some of the topics in the course, you can go and, and find a little bit more information in those books. So um, otherwise, yeah, I think you guys know me, I know you, and you know Lotta, so uh, I think 
the kind of basic information is more or less the same as, uh, as it was in the, the GeoPython course. Um, grading is going to be pretty similar as well. There's seven exercises for this course. Um, they're worth half the grade. And uh, the other part is a final project um, sort of paper thing that you write. It's based really on exercises uh, six and seven. So those last two, the exercises themselves aren't necessarily, you don't have to do that much for the exercises, but you're going to take some of the things, you, the figures you generate and stuff like that and uh, put them into, uh, into a final paper that I can describe briefly in just a second. Uh, looks like I've got a bad link here. So um, anyway, the, you know, we're going to have weekly exercises like we did in GeoPython. And, um, and then the difference is here that there is this additional report at the end of the course. The information about that's already available on the course page. So uh, you don't necessarily need to worry about the details right now. But if you're interested, you can go and, and read what the description is for this final uh, paper. Tentative due date is the 21st of December. So that's like the Friday, maybe a week after the course ends. Um, but that is a tentative due date. If things look like absolute disaster at the end of the period two, I'm always happy to be a little flexible with these kind of deadlines. Um, but the general idea is you're going to write some text that's like six to eight pages long. And you'll have figures from some of the earlier exercises and some uh, descriptive text. And then I've given you a list of different articles that you can read through um, for some background information for the, the paper. It's supposed to be kind of like the style of a scientific journal article, but you know, no longer than six or maybe eight pages. Um, so it's not, you know, it takes a little bit of, of effort and time from you, but it's uh, hopefully not going to be um, too terribly difficult. And uh, this, yeah, is described in more detail here. I don't want to go through it right now because it's just not going to be relevant for us for a few weeks at least. Um, but it does bring up one other thing I wanted to mention, and that is for, as you saw in my email that I sent, um, you know, if you're interested, if you're a bachelor student and interested in getting some English language credit points, you can get two credits from taking this additional uh, integrated English language, uh, I can't remember what the course is, called, but English language component of the course, where you'll learn some additional things that will be relevant to writing this final article. So like if you want to um, practice some of your skills in, in English, you can take that and get the two credit points. And it will also help in the end with writing this, uh, this article. So the instructor for that course knows what we're doing, and she knows that this is the kind of final thing we have to do, and she's going to try to help. Um, get things in line so that writing this is uh, as straightforward as possible. Um, the other thing I just want to mention briefly just about general course stuff is here. So we're still using Slack. And um, you can go, if you go to the GeoPython Slack like we were using previously, in the general channel, there's a post here that I made that has links to join the weekly discussions for um, for this course. So they're just, there's different channels here. We didn't want to auto-subscribe everyone to those channels because half the people are in the uh, auto GIS course and half of you are in quantitative geology. But if you click on one of the links, it will allow you to join the channel. And, um, and then that way, if there are things that come up related to the exercise or, or lesson materials, you can post them in there and, uh, and we'll pay attention. So um, feel free to you know post something in here if you want to, just to test out this week one discussion channel. Do you have any questions, or is this all sounding like pretty much different course name, but same idea? Okay, any, I don't know, other, if you don't have questions, other concerns? Is this, uh, I don't think I've forgotten to say anything big about the general course setup, but. 
So, all right. So then, um, why don't we take a look at what we're going to do for this week? And um, so, lesson one is here, and you can see the kind of overview of what we're going to cover. We still have the link to the previous um, video from last year. <coughs> But the general idea here is there's a couple things we have to meet in NumPy, a couple useful functions we didn't use in um, the GeoPython course, but otherwise we're going to talk a little bit about some basic statistics and, and basic geostatistics um, that's related to this week's exercise. In general, in this course, there's going to be less time where we're sitting here like doing things interactively with me talking and you sort of following along with the lesson and more time where you're just working on the exercise during class. So I will normally have some kind of introductory lecture where we talk about what the topic is for the week and introduce the ideas, but then um, usually you're going to have like at least an hour or hour and a half of the time that you're free to be working on the exercise. So um, that should hold true for, for today as well. So if you... Um, if you want to, you can go to the lesson stuff on a few more useful NumPy functions and either launch a binder or CSC notebook or whatever your preferred uh, environment is for, for working. I'm going to go here to the CSC notebooks. If you do that as well, you'll notice there is this new option for JupyterLab-IntroQG. Uh, that one's for us. Um, you'll want to use that instead of the GeoPython uh, blueprint in this um, CSC notebook system because the other one copies the course materials from GeoPython over to the environment and this link will copy the materials for this course. So in other words, like the notebooks won't be, they won't show up for you if you don't uh, use the, the intro QG um, Jupyter Lab link. If you launch it from the the course page, that should should use that link automatically. So um, I'm going to wait for mine to come up here. And uh, yeah, we're working in this NumPy notebook. I think all the links and binders should work just normally. If there's problems, let me know. But uh, I tried to test all that stuff. And um, yeah, for us, essentially, there's a couple things we need to to learn how to use in NumPy that were not available in Pandas at all. And uh, because they weren't um, available in Pandas, we had no reason really to mention them in the GeoPython part of the course because we more or less did the same stuff that people were doing in Pandas using NumPy in that course. But um, yeah, we're going to see a couple things. And if, since we're going to use NumPy, we can start by doing an, an import of NumPy as NP is kind of normal thing to bring in NumPy. Uh, I don't have internet on this other computer, so uh, I'm going to have to try to remember how this lesson goes. But we can bring in NumPy um, like this, like we have in the past, and hopefully that's nice and familiar. And our first task is related to defining the values of the sine function for some range of Value. So like, let's say we wanted to calculate the sine of x from x equals 0 to x equals 2 pi. One of the things we need to do in NumPy then is to be able to define a range of values of x from some starting value to an ending value with equal increments, kind of like the range function that you would have seen back in the Python lesson on lists. So in our case, um, what we can do is say, uh, for instance, that x equals np.lin space. That's uh, one of our new things here. And we're going to define this at uh, starting at 0, going to 2 times np.pi. So that's a nice handy shortcut for the value of pi is np.pi. And we want to do that in 10 steps. So what this linspace function does is allows us to define a value that starts at some number, or just it's defining an array rather. It starts at some number, 
goes to some ending value, in this case 2 times pi, and then the number of steps you want to have, or the to total number of values in the array that we're going to produce, will be 10. So if you run that, we can then print out what the value of x is, and we should see that we have 10 numbers, and you can count them if you want, but uh, there's 10. And it starts at 0, and it goes to 2 pi, and it's in equal increments of whatever you need to divide equally to go from 0 to 2 pi in 10 steps. Yeah. Why do you have to So you don't necessarily need to set this as a float because it's automatically going to be converted to a float uh, because of this np.py. I do it just out of habit because it's um, to avoid cases where something would be converted or listed as an integer. Uh, the 10, this is the number of steps you have, so that's always going to be a whole number. So, um, yeah, I mean, you could put in 10.0 and it won't complain. Uh, actually, it will complain. Uh, so, yeah, it warns you in this case that it's, you know, this is something that should explicitly be an integer value and uh, that you shouldn't put it into the float. You mean here? No, I mean, if you put in, I think if you did it with, uh, if you did the math, well, actually, in this case, I think no matter what, you're going to get floating point numbers because it's going to do a division to do equal increments, and that should always give you a float back when you do division. So even if you said, like, you want to go from 1 to 10 in 10 steps, I think, yeah, those are floating point values that come back. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. I just, out of habit, usually put 0, 0.0 and 2 times np.py. So this is our values of x. And so what we've done here with this function, we've, we've just defined an array. This is a numpy array, um, 10 values as we've seen. If we wanted to, we could do something like uh, x.shape. Oops, sorry, that's... Uh, X dot shape would tell us that there's 10 values in here. We can see there's 10, but if you had, you know, a thousand or 10,000, you couldn't see that very easily. You could use the shape to see the size. And we could also do X dot D type to see that we have floating point values in here again as we as we expect. So um, yeah, that's useful. This allows us to just start at some number, end at another, put in whatever number of substeps we want. And, uh, and that's all good. That's described a little bit more in the text that's down here that says how this lin space function works. So once we define x, then we can go on to something like the calculating the sine of x. So if we said like y equals np.sine of x, that's just the numpy sine function. And if we then print out the values of, of y, what should we expect for the first number? Zero. We get zero. So it's always good to have some idea when you do some kind of calculation like this what you should expect to see. And sure enough, the sine of zero is zero. And we can see it goes up to a value, in this case, not quite equal to one because we don't have, uh, in our list of values, we don't exactly have the value of uh, pi over two because of the way things are divided here. Uh, if we divide it by 11, that would work, but anyway. Um, and you can see that it comes back to pretty close to zero. Here's a nice example of the round off or rounding of numbers in, uh, in Python that we, instead of getting back exactly zero like we would expect it at um, the sine of 2 pi, we get minus 2.5 or 2.45 uh, times 10 to the minus 16. So really close to zero, but not exactly zero which is either because the value of pi is approximated, which it is in numpy, or that our, um, that our function gives us back something that's not exactly equal to zero. But Anyway, it's easy to do these kind of calculations where you define an array, and then once you've defined all the values of x, you can calculate the sine of those values. 
And if you wanted to, you could then plot that or, or do whatever um, from that point. But we'll be doing a lot of stuff with this kind of NP lin space function where we want to define a list of values like depth in the earth from 0 to 100 kilometers in steps of 10 meters or something. So um, you'll get practice with that. There's one other way you can do something quite similar in, uh, in NumPy, and that's to use another function called a range. So we could define a variable called x2 in this case, and say x2 is equal to np.a range, a range. And similarly, this you want to start with uh, values of 0 going to 2 times np.pi. But the difference here is that we don't specify how many steps we want to take with the a range function, but rather the size of the increment between values. So if we say 0 0.5, that means we're going to start at 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and so on, up until we get somewhere close to this value of uh, 2 pi. So if 2, point, or 2 pi is something like 6.28, we should expect to see values that go up to about 6 in this array since we're going in steps of, of 0 0.5. So if we print out then x2, sure enough we see 0, 0 0.5, 1, so equal increments of 0 0.5 up to 6, and then that's it. So the important thing here to remember is that this works like the range function did. If you remember back to the Python lists, uh, early stuff, maybe week two of the GeoPython course. This last value will never be included in the values in this array. So if we said, like, let's go from 0 to 2 pi in steps of np.pi over 2, you might expect to then get 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. But we only get the first four values, not that last value to, that's included in here. So like the range function where when you did range 0, 5, you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you don't get that fifth value, or that the last ending value, that's how this a range function works. This last value here will never be included. If we said np.pi as uh, that plus 0. 0.0000001, this will work because it's just a tiny bit bigger than 2 pi. And now when we print out, we get 2 pi included in the list of values here. Um, this is a sort of little trick sometimes. If you want to, say, specify what the increment is between the values and you want to go from some starting value to some ending value, you can just add some tiny number there, make it a little bit bigger than 2 pi, and, and things will work. If you don't understand how that works, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not so important. The key thing is for this a range function is that it allows you to specify the step between the values. Um, that's our lesson for NumPy for today. So it's those two functions. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to introduce them in the GeoPython course because we never use them, but here they're, they're quite important. You can't do this in pandas, and uh, this is one of the reasons why we why we use NumPy. Um, there's several others, but uh, but this is one. Yeah. Yeah. So for LinSpace, it will always include that last value. So the reason I kind of yeah make a point of saying it is because like that is how a range and LinSpace will be different. That here it will always include this last value. So, um, you know, if we wanted to go from zero to a thousand, maybe that's an easier thing in, uh, in 10 steps. We're always going to start at zero, always going to end at a thousand, and it will just divide equally to give you the step in between the two. So this increment or this number of steps thing, you can start to play around with. Like if you say, you know, let's say I asked you to go from 0 to 1,000 in steps of 100, how would you do that with lin space? Like, what would you change here? So let's say that 
we wanted to find x to go from 0 to 1,000 in steps of 100 meters, but using the lin space instead of using the A range. Because you can do the same thing with both, like you can flip it around either way. Um, it's oftentimes like you just kind of have to think of what the problem is you're dealing with about whether lin space is more helpful or A range. But how would you do it here? Like what would you have to change in this case? Yeah, so this is one of the things that's a little bit weird. As you look at this, and you say, okay, well, 0 to 1,000 in you know, equal increments of 100. I should just take 10 as my number of steps. But you would divide by 10 to get the step size, but it's actually 11 steps because you include the starting and ending values. So if we make that 11, then we get nice even increments of 100 meters. If we wanted to do the same thing with the A range function, so let's go down here and say we want to go from zero, well, we want the step size to be 100. We know that. That's the nice thing about A range. We know the step size. But how would you get something like if you want to go from zero to 1,000 in the list of values in the array? Because if you put in 1,000 here, what's the problem? Right. So... So how could you cheat and get this thing to include a thousand as the last value? Yeah, as long as it's smaller than the step size, you could put in 1,099. As long as it won't include that last value, you could put in 1,100. And as long as it's not included in the next step, it will then print out what you want. So you could put in, you know, 1001 or 1000.0000, you know, a bunch of zeros and one. I think if you put more than 16 zeros, it might round that to, to being a thousand, but, uh, hmm? yeah, yeah. I mean, here even it's rounded this to be a thousand with this many zeros, but if I take out a few, uh, then I get a thousand included in the list. So anything just slightly bigger than that ending value, but smaller than the next step, is is the way you can kind of cheat with this a range function. Um, yeah. So anyway, you'll play around with this stuff a little bit, and I think the hands-on experience will teach you more than I could just sitting here showing you other various examples. But are there any questions about this? Not a terribly big amount of NumPy stuff to take in, but um, you will find that these functions can be a little bit trickier than they seem, um, depending on the problem that you're that you're dealing with. Um, but okay, if there aren't any questions, then we're going to go jump back here to the course page, and uh, I'm going to go through a couple things just about some basic statistical ideas because the lesson for this week and the exercise is really focused on. Um, developing some kind of basic statistical tools and we're going to keep it pretty simple um, but the end goal for the exercise is going to be converting some of these things that we see here is mathematical equations into Python code. Uh, before we can get into like the equations for some of these basic statistical things we do have to introduce a couple ideas that may or may not be familiar to you. I'm assuming uh, has anybody taken a course in statistics? Like, no. Okay, so a couple people had like basics, but I think, you know, normally I assume nobody has had really like a, a statistics course. Um, I'm certainly not qualified to teach a kind of proper course on statistics, but we can introduce a few basic things. Um, there's a lot of text on the web page that you can read through about this stuff, but I'm just going to kind of highlight uh, a couple ideas. And these are things that are really relevant for us as geoscientists. Um, the first one is starting with the idea of, of populations and samples. So, um, you know, in terms of the concept, the population would be the complete, you know, basically all of the number of occurrences of some entity that you're interested in looking at. So if it was like, I don't know, Paleozoic, crinoid fossils or something like that, it would be like the population could be all of them that exist on the planet. And, um, and typically, you know, for us when we're dealing with this stuff, 
we don't have access to the population of all of these fossils because we don't have any way to deal with much more than, than the rocks that are exposed at the surface. And so often what we're dealing with is some, some sample out of that population. So it's some subgroup out of the much, much larger um, group of all of these fossils, for instance, or, or whatever. Um, so the hope is that when we go out and we want to say something about, for instance, I don't know, the, the paleo environment of where these crinoid fossils um, were living, that we can go out and we can collect enough samples of these creatures to say something about the environment. Um, and this is the kind of idea of a representative sample. So what we hope to get is a sample that does actually properly represent the much larger population. Since we have no way to, to access the entire population, um, we want to get you know just something that is representative. You could think about this like if you had a, a bucket full of different colored marbles and you know that you know you poured a hundred green and a hundred blue and a hundred red in there. And as you take out random samples of the marbles, over time you start to see that there's kind of equal numbers of green ones and blue ones and red ones. But at first you could take out you know five green ones in a row and say, oh, the bucket's full of green marbles. So there's you know this kind of representation or representative sample idea is something you know, given how little rock exposure you might have of, uh, of something you want to sample, um, it's really quite relevant for, for us. So there's a couple figures here that I think nicely kind of illustrate this, this idea of the trouble that you can get into. And that is here, let's say we've got some population, this could be like, you know, some tray full of fossils. And if you randomly select them, in one case, Here's one sample. So this is, I don't know what, eight or seven of the fossils randomly taken out. And here's a second sample. And you can see, for instance, here that the first sample, you've gotten a bias in the sense that you've gotten mainly the large fossils out of this population here. So this might lead you to say that there were no kind of small creatures living in this area or whatever. Um, I'm not a kind of paleontology person, so I don't know what else you could say about these things. but. In the second sample, you see just the opposite effect. You've, you've sort of, just by chance, avoided the bigger fossils. And again, that might lead you to say, like, okay, well, I guess, is this a brachiopod? I don't know if anybody knows what that thing is. I think that's what those are called. Anyway, you might think that, you know, there's none of them living here because we don't get any brachiopods or, or whatever. Um, so the, the point is, it can, you, know, you can lead yourself to different conclusions based on not getting a representative sample. In this case, neither one of these samples are representative because we don't have the sort of mix of large and small fossils that are present in the population in either one of the samples. This is not something that's easy to deal with, geologically speaking, because oftentimes we're very limited in terms of where we can collect our samples. And even so, like I know from the perspective of doing um, various dating methods, that once you've collected the sample, you then take the sampled material and maybe you're looking for a certain mineral like zircons, and you go looking through the zircon grains one by one looking for the really nice ones and not the ones that are broken or not the ones that are um, looking like they've been weathered or anything like that. So you kind of even further take out uh, a big part of what the material is that you've sampled and then you draw your conclusions based on this very small subset of, of minerals, for instance. So anyway, I guess the concept here is pretty clear. Um, here is another scenario that you can envision. And this is one in which we have two different populations. So here's population number one, where you can see there's more of these guys that I called brachiopods, probably incorrectly, um, and some other kind of trilobites and stuff. And there's another population down below. And what you can see here is an example of two samples that look the same, which would lead you to conclude that these two populations are the same. Um, and it's, while it's true that, you know, most of the same creatures that are sampled in sample two here are present in sample one, 
you can see that you know when you look at the whole population here there's almost well there's, there's one I think trilobite there's a bunch of them down here and there are other things that are present here that aren't present in the other sample so this is the kind of underlying idea that um, that we've got to face regularly and um, the reason why there are things like you don't go out and collect one rock sample and say okay you know I got a nice uh, paleoproterozoic granite I'm gonna say that you know I can look at all the minerals are here and I know how the, the sort of um, composition of paleozoic granites worldwide based on this one sample of course that's foolish uh, but you know this is the reason why we have to do things like collect many samples in different locations repeat measurements and things like that because there's a lot of variability in uh, in geological data in nature and even you know these two examples here are kind of nice illustrations but you could imagine it gets a lot worse when you have many different um, fossils and things that are broken some that are preserved better than others and and things like that so uh, yeah I guess this idea of kind of the population and the sample of the population makes makes sort of intuitive sense. If we look at uncertainty, um, this is you know something again that we're kind of, I think, broadly aware of. Um, I always like to use the example of uh, like friends of mine who work in the oil industry, where if you want to go out and um, go drilling for oil offshore, you have to be pretty confident about where you're going to be drilling because it's extremely expensive. So like drilling ship is something like 350,000 euros per day and operating an oil platform is about 300,000 euros per day. So if you tell your sort of group of people that you should go and drill somewhere and you drill for a few weeks and don't find any oil, you've just cost your company a few million euros and may have cost yourself a job. So um, uncertainty is certainly something that is the you know varying now, I don't think any of us are sort of currently in such high stakes uh, situations, but uh, you know, you may one day find yourself in similar kinds of scenarios where you have to make decisions about things based on limited information, and considering your uncertainty is going to be very important in making those kind of decisions. So uh, let's talk about some kind of general concepts here. Again, we can look at some figures to sort of illustrate the ideas. Um, when we talk about uncertainty, there's kind of two general classes of, uh, of uncertainty that relate to the ideas of being precise and being accurate. So if you consider something like making measurements of the age of some mineral in a, in a laboratory, if you get the same age when you repeat the analysis on the same uh, minerals, you know, that's, that's good in terms of precision, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that age is accurate. So it may be that the age is, is actually systematically wrong every time you do the analysis, but it does give you the same age every time. Um, and that's kind of shown here with the sort of these bullseyes here, where uh, we can look at different um, different kinds of of errors. So when we talk about precision, we're talking about having a small random error between measurements. So um, that is like this kind of tight cluster of points here or the tight cluster of points over here. Both cases, they're precise. The random error or the variation between measurements, this would be like if you go to your dating laboratory and date the same mineral, you get back the same age um, you know, with some variation, but, but more or less the same kind of tight cluster in ages um, over and over. But you don't necessarily, when you're dating a mineral, you don't know where this target is. So you don't know whether you've hit the center of the bullseye or like you're somewhere over here off to the right of the center of the bullseye. Uh, and that's that's the unfortunate reality if you don't have any kind of other external way to constrain the age, for instance, you don't know whether you're right or wrong even though your laboratory analysis might say like, hey I've got very little variation, this must be a really good good measurement. So here, random error is small, systematic error is large, meaning that in this case on the right, we're shifted way off of the, the point where we expect to be in the middle of the bullseye. 
The other idea here has to do with accuracy. And in both the cases down here at the bottom, we see uh, examples of things that are, are not good in terms of the accuracy. Um, and you, you know, if this was like you in some competition to sort of, I don't know, win a medal for shooting a bow and arrow or something, um, you know, you're probably not going to win like this because you're kind of getting you know, all over the place in terms of trying to hit the target in the middle. So that's a large um, problem in terms of the accuracy of the, uh, or sorry, this is not very precise, but it's, um, it's also, yeah, not very necessarily accurate. So again, precision is going to tell us whether we've got small variations between the measurements. Accuracy is going to say how big is the variation with the random error. And so this kind of largely scattered set of points here shows us that we're not very accurate. Um, and in this case, we're not precise, nor are we accurate because we're not hitting the center of the bullseye like we expect to. <coughs> so you can consider an example of this where if you know, for instance, like there was some volcanic eruption that's been dated by many different methods and you want to establish some new dating method on some random, um, not very often used mineral, if you get an age back that is consistent with the measurements from other uh, dating of kind of well-established methods, then that could tell you something about whether or not your measurement is accurate. Essentially, you need to have some kind of outside control to assess whether you have an accurate measurement. Um, and then the precision thing is, you know, of course, going to be how variable um, the measurements are between one another. If we talk about this in terms of, of terminology that we could um, use, you know, this would basically be showing us that we've got a large error bar, a large uncertainty, um, large deviation in the measurements uh, in this lower case here. So the figures that are shown behind here, or below here rather, um, will show us that you know often what we can see very easily is the the precision, whether our random error is small or large, but we don't often know you know where the target is that we're that we're trying to face. So um, that makes life a little bit more difficult. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Okay, so a couple other things we got to handle, and then we can get to an ex sort of uh, explanation of the uh, overview of the exercise. So when it comes to what we're going to be dealing with, um, essentially we're going to be, in the exercise for this week, doing some things like computing the mean value, uh, computing standard deviation, standard error, other things like that uh, in Python. And this relates to the idea in which we want to report measurements just in general. And that is that we should give our best estimate plus or minus some kind of measure of the uncertainty. So, um, you know, if it's age data, oftentimes it means we're going to give the mean age plus or minus some variation in age that's either based on repeat measurements or the variation in uh, dates from the laboratory. Uh, very often, it's the repeat measurements will vary much more than than uh, um, dating the same sort of sample or standard within the laboratory. So most laboratories are quite good in terms of the precision, but uh, if you date several minerals out of one sample, you'll get different ages, and that natural variation is usually much bigger. So um, calculating mean value is generally pretty easy. Sum things up and divide by the number of measurements, and then this can also, um, we can add in the, for instance, standard deviation as a way to report this um, uncertainty that we have in our measurement. So I guess maybe you've seen this kind of thing before, uh, I should hope. Mean value, I think everybody knows how to calculate the mean value of something already. Um, here's just the formula for, for the mean. Um, you're going to write a function to calculate this in Python. So um, you'll convert this to Python code for the exercise for this week. But the idea is that if you've got, you know, 10 measurements, you just add those up and divide by 10 to find out what the average value is. 
Um, and that's you know something that's I think quite familiar to all of us. Now for any given one of those measurements what you can calculate if you like is something called deviation and the deviation is defined here as just the difference between whatever the value is that you have and the average for the set. So like let's say we had um, I don't know we had taken the temperature outside for every day for a month and we calculated what the average temperature was for the month of October for instance. Then for any given day in October if we know what the temperature is for that day we could see okay well how much does it vary or how much does it deviate from that mean value. This is kind of like when we calculate the temperature anomalies uh, for some of the GeoPython exercises. And this allows us to see you know is the day warmer or colder than, than average for the month. And you might expect, for instance, in October, where things are kind of cooling down, <clears throat> that maybe it's warmer than average at the start of the month and colder than average at the end. Um, so that's deviation. And uh, you might think that you could take this and, okay, oh, I, well, let's calculate deviation for every single day of the month and add those together to figure out how much, on average, the... Um, the temperatures deviate from the mean value. But the problem with this is that if you sum all these values together, you get exactly zero back for the deviation because you're just, when you've calculated the mean and you take the difference from the mean value for each day and add those all together, it just gives you back zero because you've calculated the average value at the start. So instead, we use this standard deviation, which is a little bit different. Um, the main difference is that it's the deviation squared in here for the standard deviation and um, so that by squaring the difference between the value and the mean then you're always going to get some positive uh, number out of that so that when you add things together you will get cumulatively some uh, measure of how much the average day deviates from or any day deviates from the average. So we square that, sum the values together, and then take the square root uh, after multiplying by one over the number of measurements. So this is kind of like doing the average deviation squared, and then you take the square root of, of that. Um, one thing I didn't mention here is, do you guys, have you, do you know what the sigma notation is? Some? So, all we're saying here, this is just shorthand, it's spelled out in the hints for this week's exercise how it works in a little bit more detail. But in case you're not familiar, if you have some number of measurements, this sigma xi just means you just take each one of those measurements uh, and add them together. So it's just a shorthand for doing a summation. So same thing is happening here. In this case, what we would be doing is summing together the squared deviation for all of the measurements. And then once you've summed that together, you divide by n and take the square root. So um, that's, yeah, that's standard deviation. Um, there is some cases where there's a different version of the standard deviation equation that's used. Uh, I put it on here just for the sake of being complete. But um, if you consider the case where you have one measurement, and you go to calculate the standard deviation, you can do that from here. Um, but you're going to get back a value that's exactly equal to zero, which suggests that there's no uncertainty, or that the standard deviation of zero would say, like, you know, this is the perfect representation. So there's an alternative form here that basically says if you have one measurement, um, that the standard deviation will be undefined. You can see that here if you just take um, and put in a value of 1 for n here, that you're going to get 1 divided by 0. And essentially all that tells us is that we have no way to define the standard deviation for one measurement. Logically, it makes a little bit more sense, um, but the equation is just a slight bit different than the one above. And as you go to larger and larger numbers of measurements, these two equations more or less will give you back the same value for the standard deviation. 
if you have three or four measurements, you know, the, the difference between the two values of standard deviation that you would calculate with each equation might be a little bit bigger, but as you go to hundreds of measurements, they basically will give you more or less the same value back. Um, but does this, this kind of idea make sense that if you have one measurement, you know, having a zero standard deviation doesn't necessarily make sense because that gives you a false sense that there's no uncertainty. Uh, when in actuality, if you only have one measurement, you have a, you know, an undefined amount of uncertainty. Okay, so um, one other value we can define here, again, uh, just as a, a note, you will also convert the standard deviation equation to, uh, to Python code in the exercise for this week, as you will with this other one here, which is the standard error or standard deviation of the mean, um, which is just the standard deviation value divided by the square root of the number of measurements. All this is meant to do is that it will decrease the size of the standard deviation as you go to having larger and larger numbers of measurements. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't know how to say this, um, I don't think uninteresting is the right word, but uh, there's a lot of discussion about the differences between standard deviation and standard error. If you want to go looking around online, you can find a great number of opinions from different sort of statistical people about which one is more meaningful than others um, and, and how they measure different things. There's, I sort of briefly summarize the differences here about the standard deviation giving you some idea of how much the average value differs from the mean value. Um, and the standard error is more a measurement of the uncertainty in the estimate of the mean. Um, it's not super important that you understand how those two differ from one another, but the important thing is that when you're dealing with this kind of data and when you're, for instance, you know, in your master's thesis or something or bachelor's thesis, maybe including a table with some data, that you're very clear about whether the uncertainty is a standard deviation or standard error or something else. Because, um, you know, oftentimes you'll see, you know, some column that lists um, the uncertainty, but it's, it can be, you know, sort of ambiguous. And obviously, these two equations are different, so the meaning of the values is going to be different for people that go to use them. So, all right, uh, let's move to one more topic here, um, and then we'll, we'll take a look at the exercise. So this has to do with something called the normal distribution, um, which you might also know as like a Gaussian curve. Essentially, this is meant to visually show us the way in which values are distributed about some mean value. So if we took, for instance, um, the example I have here from this textbook where there's some geostatistics stuff is the, uh, the slope angle of cinder cones. So, um, you know, there might be some average value that's around 35 degrees, but there's going to be some that are steeper than average, some that are not as steep as average. And the tails of this distribution show us the kind of frequency of the occurrence of cinder cones that have a really low slope. They don't occur very frequently. Of course, the mean is the most frequent uh, value that you would observe. And then those that are really steep also don't occur very frequently. So they've got a low probability or low frequency of, uh, of occurrence. So you've probably seen these kind of things before, I'm guessing. You've seen this kind of Gaussian curve before as a way to... Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just a... We can report actually the same kind of information that we could with the best value plus or minus the standard deviation, for instance. This is just a different way to graphically illustrate the, uh, oops, the same kind of thing. So here we can see, for instance, um, that our mean value in this case is denoted with the uh, Greek letter mu is going to be at the highest point in this sort of um, Gaussian curve, and then the plus or minus one standard deviation is going to take us out some distance away from the mean, uh, in which I think 
something like 68% of the observations we would have would fall within this plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. If we go to two standard deviations or two times sigma away from the mean value, then we get something like 95% of the observations should be within this range. And so then things that are out here on either side further away from the mean than two sigma are going to be only the sort of 5% or the, you know, the rare occurrences of uh, very steep or very shallow angles of the uh, cinder cones, for instance. Um, anyway, I think the kind of graphical representation is probably somewhat intuitive. Um, and again, in this exercise for this week, the second problem that you'll deal with will be um, making some plots of, well, things just like this. So we're going to calculate this Gaussian curve and then plot it for different age observations. Do you have any questions or anything? I don't know, at this point, that's the kind of end of the very quick introduction to some basic geostatistics that are probably things you mostly have some familiarity with already. All right, so if there's nothing more, then we can go here, and uh, I think I just realized that I didn't make the exercise uh, visible yet. So I'll do that in just a second. Um, so, yeah, bear with me. Don't necessarily click this GitHub Classroom link yet because uh, you won't be able to see the exercise. But I will uh, unhide it in just a second. But yeah, we can do a quick introduction here to the exercise first. So two problems for this week's exercise, and um, the general ideas around dealing with geostatistics and visualizing some geostatistical data. The first problem is essentially just converting some of these equations we saw into Python code. So we have some age data here. It's just in a table. And rather than reading in a data file, I'm just suggesting that you make a, a few Python lists that include these different ages with the different sample names. So for instance, F09, you could just make a list called F09 that has these numbers in it for, for the ages. Um, in case you're interested, these are basically minerals that were dated out of the same rock sample. And this shows for repeat analysis of the same mineral how much the age can vary within one rock sample. Um, and there's more details about the dating method and stuff that you can find in this article here if you're curious. But uh, anyway, there's five samples here, so you make these five lists and put your numbers in there. And then um, you're going to convert this mean equation into a Python code. Of course, you know that in NumPy you could just take some array and do dot mean to calculate the mean value. Um, but that's not the point of the exercise here. The point is to not use NumPy and to convert this into Python using a, for instance, like a for loop and, uh, and just built-in things in Python. So you shouldn't need to use NumPy for coming up with this mean equation at all. Um, and what you'll do is you can convert that mean equation into a function. You can call it mean. And, um, and then what you are asked to do in the exercise is print out the value you get for each of the samples. So each of these samples here, calculate the mean value, and then you can also print out what the, the same value would be when you use the np.mean or numpy mean function. Um, and you should get the same thing if your code is working correctly. So, um, so that's that. And uh, I've already defined in here, in your version of the exercise, the name of the function. And I've also put in this thing here. Have you got, did we introduce doc strings at all in GeoPython? Do you remember? Maybe not. So anyway, um, there's a hint about this on the exercise page. These things in triple quotes right after the de definition of a function, there's kind of like a little string of text that um, if the person using it wrote like help mean, it would display this text that just says what the function does. So here it says returns the average value of a collection of numbers. 
So um, I've included doc strings here just because that's a good thing to do. If you're confused about this, you can look in the hints for the exercise this week and you'll see a more of a description of how these work and, and how to get this information. Uh, but you can do this for functions or whole codes or whatever, um, lots of different things. So after you do the mean, then you're going to do the same thing with standard deviation. And um, standard deviation, you know, the equation again is we're just going to do this form, not the n minus 1 version of the standard deviation equation. But uh, you should get the same kind of thing. Uh, those numbers shouldn't be the same, so maybe there's something doesn't look quite right. Um, anyway, yeah, standard deviation numbers you'll get uh, here. And um, in this case, you will have to use, I've suggested using the math square root function because there is a square root in here and I'm not going to expect you to write your own function to calculate the square root of something. Um, that's not necessarily that difficult, but it's it's not really the focus. But since we're doing a square root, you'll need to use the square root function. So you can use the math um, math module for for that. And then lastly, you'll do the same kind of exercise with the uh, standard error. So you'll also convert that to a Python function and then use it to um, calculate standard error of the age data and then compare against NumPy again. After that, then there's just a few questions you can answer in text um, in in the notebook for this this problem. So, is that clear for the first problem? What to do? Um, problem number two. Oh no, what's this doing? Uh, looks like it's not formatted nicely. Uh, anyway, this problem number two is. Um, where you can calculate some of these Gaussian curves. And so you can use the same data from the problem one. You've calculated means and standard deviations from problem one, and then you're going to use those in problem two to calculate the normal distribution of error. So this is the kind of bell curve thing that we just saw. Um, you'll calculate it for the age data here. I put in the table. But basically, you're going to create a function to do this uh, calculation of the Gaussian or the, the normal distribution of error. Uh, I'll see if I can fix the format of this equation real quick before I make the... Yeah, something has gone weird here on this. Uh, maybe it's just that it's this version of the format and, uh, and GitHub doesn't look right. I think the notebook should be fine. Um, anyway, if you take the same age data, in the end, you're going to end up making a plot of the Gaussian curves for the different age measurements that are in the table of dates that uh, that you're given. And if I go here quickly to the uh, exercise hints here, um, you're going to produce a plot that looks something like this. So you'll make these kind of curves for the uh, normal distributions, and then you're also going to add in a plot with an error bar for the, the point that's the mean value and then one standard deviation away from the mean uh, in terms of the length of the error bars. So you can see here there's five samples. These are the five different ages um, that you have. Those are the points here should be the mean value for the age and then the curves are showing us the kind of probability of occurrence. So in some cases it's very well defined narrow range of ages for repeat measurements. In other cases like the red one here there's a very large amount of variation between um, the ages that were calculated in that in that sample. So you're going to end up making a plot like this. Conveniently enough, it's in you know an example of the plot is in the uh, exercise hints for this week. So you can kind of get a sense if you're confused about what to do for certain steps, you can come here and, and figure out how to format your plot. Once you've made the plot, again, there's a couple questions you can answer at the end of the exercise. So, yeah, any questions? <laughs>